15 questions with the prestigious Cleveland Clinic Internal Medicine Program Director. I would like to start by asking you as a program director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program, what do you look for in an internal medicine applicant? That's a that's a great question and one that we get. And I'm, I'm sorry that I can't just go or I'm not going through my recruiting spiel because I think it's so important to let applicants know, you know, what are the things that we're looking for? Um, and, and it's it's actually sim more simple than you may uh, think or that others may may admit. So we're looking, obviously, for some degree of accomplishment. Um, but it isn't like Nobel Prize winning accomplishment. It, it, it comes in many different ways. So the accomplishment that we're looking for is it really, I think, simple in the fact that we want to we want to be able to project whether someone will take good care of patients. So we're looking for evidence of of that potential, but also evidence of establishing, you know, some of the benchmarks that we want to see people do. When we think about medical students and transitioning into residency, we think about what they're able to do and what they're able to uh, potentially do with with additional training. And you know, one of those things is we we all lump patient care into you know patient care, but actually it's reporting on patients. It's being able to navigate uh, patients through a, a healthcare setting whether that's note writing or whether that's writing orders. So, you know, obviously we look for people that have excellent patient care skills as demonstrated by what rotations they've done, where they've done them. And we look for surrogates for that sort of proof, I guess, in their letters of recommendation. So I guess, you know, Cleveland Clinic, we're a patient first organization. Uh, we really value evidence and, uh, you know, future potential in taking excellent care of patients um, in, in patient care. The other thing that we look for, I think, is um, alignment of values. Um, that, I don't know if people talk about that enough, but it's so important to understand, you know, as your professional identity forms as a medical student and through residency, that you're in the right milieu. Um, and, and if you're in a, if you find yourself in a program that doesn't align with your own personal values or future professional values, it can be very difficult to be successful. So we, we look for that. Um, we look for evidence of values and some of the surrogates we use for that are evidence of leadership, evidence of, you know, past medical education or past education, like people that used to be teachers, people that were maybe leaders in their community, wherever they're from. Uh, and we look for, um, you know, evidence of real community engagement, uh, not just the things you do for like, a, you know, one day or, you know, Habitat for Humanity is great, but if you do that for just one day, does that really make a meaningful impact in your community? So we look for, you know, that alignment of values because we're we're in it in our medical center in our program for the long haul, and we 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 like to see an alignment of values because we we think people do better in that situation. Um, and then there's another element too. I think we really look for, and and I think it may come in different forms, but scholarly potential or scholarly uh, achievement. Those are very different things. Um, so I guess we look for people that are curious <laughs> to, to sort of simplify it, either curious about, uh, you know, academic uh, medical research questions or curious about other forms of, you know, scholarship or 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 curious about the world based on past careers or, or what, what they've sort of done. So those those are three big pillars that I think of that we look for. And 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 hopefully, you know, if I were if I were to show you like our rubric, how we look at, you know, students records, it's very holistic. Um, it's not just one thing. It's it's like a whole bunch of things, and it all sorts of sorts of sort of adds up um, over time. Um, and 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 I think if you met anybody in our program, you would see that we have a, a a great diversity of backgrounds and a great diversity of experiences because of that holistic process that we currently have. That is a very uh, you know comprehensive answer to a very complex question. A lot of students think that. Step scores, and we'll go over these details in a second. Step scores, if I don't get a score, I'm not mad, but it's way more complex than that. And I love the way you divide it into multiple areas. And some people might be, you know, advanced in research, they're not that much into academic, uh, sorry, like the leadership skills, but others have that versus others. So, and the idea of having a diverse group of residents is, you know, now the topic of every medical journal, every medical education that we need to increase diversity in our. Uh, healthcare system. So that brings me to my second question, which is, do you consider IMGs in your program? And a lot of my, you know, followers and the people watching this video are international graduates. Do you consider IMGs at the Cleveland Clinic IM program? So I, I will say abs absolutely. Um, and that's not just, 
lip service either. Um, so I, I telling a little bit about my background, you know, where I trained, um, this was not something that we saw in my training at University of North Carolina. And that's not a that's not a you know, detriment to that institution. It's a great training program, but that wasn't something that was part of my experience. But I'll be honest, in my first job at the Carilion Clinic, where there's now the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, um, I, I, my eyes were open to a couple of different realities that I hadn't been exposed to yet. And, and one of them uh, was uh, the, the great work and the great contributions that those from other countries that went to medical school in other countries, not just from the residents, but also the faculty. I mean, we, we had, um, you know, the, you know, some of the chairs and some of the other leaders in the medical center, you know, you know, you just come to find out that they weren't, you know, didn't, you know, train in all the places that maybe you'd heard of. And so for me as a newer, you know, medical educator, that was, uh, you know, is humbling uh, because you realize the world is bigger than, than maybe you thought it was. And maybe some of the paradigms that you had uh, sort of engendered or thought about, like maybe just weren't even true. And the same, the same, quite honestly, was true around osteopathic um residents we we filled our entire class of you know i think it was 19 or 20 first year residents with osteopathic and and mostly international medical grads and so um i became uh, enamored with that because i saw how good these doctors were and i worked with them and i saw them go on to learn about scholarship and learn about research and that was part of my job was to teach them that but also see them being successful in in finding jobs and, and moving on with their families. And so it was great. So, you know, when I went back then to University of North Carolina to be a program director for my first program director is the Med Peace program. It w I went back to like where I trained and it was not like that. Right. And so um, I felt, you know, maybe a little bit of pressure to, you know, think a little bit differently about things. But it was only when I was looking for the job or, and when I was interviewed for the job at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, that was actually an attractant for me, uh, was the heterogeneity of the class and the heterogeneity of the residency program. And quite quite frankly, the heterogeneity of uh, the backgrounds of the leaders. Uh, you know, Dr. Venu Menon, who's the, the program director for the cardiology program, was one of my staff members at UNC when I was a resident and he was part of the group that interviewed me for the job. And he, when we talked about it, he was very upfront. He said, this is a fantastic opportunity to get some of the best residents from all over the world. Why wouldn't you do that if you could? And I said, I agree with you. We're definitely going to keep doing that. So, you know, you, you look at the traditions and the footprint of the sort of your employer too. Cleveland clinics all over the world. It's not just in Cleveland, and uh, the richness of the um, of my own education as a you know mid career physician has only been more so because of the interactions I've had um, from the from the nature of the leadership at Cleveland Clinic too. So it it goes both ways, I think, um, from from the people you train, but it also comes from the people above. And I, I've always just. I love that about my job currently and about the place I work. So yes, we're that's a really long-winded way of saying yes, we are very uh much um we will always be looking at those from other countries. I think we have a good system for doing so and I think we've had really good success too. Those that come from our program whether they've been in the US for a year or two or they they literally come from another country to start intern year, they've done really well and I'm I'm just so humbled by the the amount of transitions they have to go through oftentimes and what they have to overcome that um, I don't think I could have done that um, when I was in training. You know, I, I moved from Ohio to North Carolina and I acted like it was the hardest thing ever. And I literally had one of the first year residents who didn't even have an apartment when he came to um, orientation and <laughs> he had to get a car, get an apartment. And here I am like working with him on the wars. He's writing notes and he's doing great work. And I, I could have never done that. So I feel like uh, in a lot of ways uh, I've grown uh, through some of these things too. And, and certainly the, the work that um, IMGs do in our program is absolutely, uh, we couldn't do it without, without, without their input. Thank you so much for uh, you and the leadership of the Cleveland Clinic for considering IMGs and having a good number of IMGs at your program. And as you said, we learn from each other. Uh, everyone should have a fair game. That's what I always say. In, in my channel is that 
Not all IMGs are great, but also not all US applicants are great. Not all osteopathic applicants are great. Some are great. There is a spectrum in each you know, group of applicants. You cannot say that I'm not considering any IMGs or I'm not considering any US applicant. Every applicant, in my opinion, deserves a fair you know, shot. They sh their application should be evaluated in a holistic way. And at that point, if you don't think they're fit for the program, that's fair. But just applying a filter of no IMGs, I don't think that's fair. And that brings me to my next question, which is, how is the selection process different between international graduates and U.S. seniors? I'm sure U.S. seniors do away rotations. They they are more knowledgeable about the system. They have letters of recommendation, maybe from people inside the Cleveland Clinic, inside big U.S. institutions. How do you how do you feel the, the, the process of selecting applicants from these two groups is different? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm at McDonald's giving away the uh, you know prize recipes for the special sauce or anything, but we we have um we we don't have two processes because we really do have just one process but the the big decision points for most residencies and i think for most candidates is that in is the interview right so um we we have a slightly different rubric for those from outside of the us um because we we know that we can't necessarily compare apples to oranges um and or you know add other fruit uh, in in that particular category, because everybody with different backgrounds, I mean, medical schools are accredited differently and there's different standards and the dean's letter looks different and the letters of recommendation that the standards. So there's a couple of things that we we look at. Um, you know, we look at historical precedent of whether we've had somebody from that school. That means, a, that probably means a lot. There There's definitely, um, you know, a factor where we, we, we do uh, look at whether someone's had U.S. Uh, experience, clinical experience, and, and they, you know, if they get a letter, but that's not to say that we don't have people that, we do have people that match with us that don't have U.S. experience or don't have, you know, letters from the Cleveland Clinic, for instance. So um, I actually think in a lot of ways, um, it's maybe even a little bit easier to recruit uh, from the pool of international medical graduates because the affinity is so high for our program. And and people are, you know, really going out of their way to demonstrate that alignment and and their interest. Um, and that's not to say that other groups are not as aligned or have that affinity. Um, but it we we sort of know what we're looking for, and and people know how to show us that, and then they come and they do well. So um, we do have the same process though. So once an interview is given. Everybody is on the same footing. Um, I'll just be completely frank about that. I mean, if you if you come in from school X and you get you know really do well on your interviews, we put a place a lot of emphasis on the interview and how you do on the interview day. There's there's a little bit of emphasis on you know your CV and letters of recommendation in the final analysis, but it's really it's more so about how you do on the interview and how that goes. So um, you know we take some things into account, but we don't. We don't do any, um, we don't do a lot of moving. We don't do any moving of, you know, once the rank list is sort of made, we don't do special favors. We don't, you know, move people up and down. Um, so I, I feel like we have a fair, as transparent as we can. And I think it's equitable. We try to make it as equitable as possible. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. I definitely answer the question. <laughs> to hear that this process is very fair and doesn't discriminate between, you know, different types of applicants. Now a lot of applicants, now we're in the end of August, beginning of September, ERAS is due in four weeks. Uh, all applicants are working on their personal statement, ERAS application. What do you look for when you're reviewing these personal statements, ERAS application? Uh, what are red flags you might exclude someone from the interview based on these and what things might impress you for an applicant? Yeah, I, I think that the, that's a really fair and transparent question. Um, so we don't, we use filters only for those things that would make someone not be a candidate to match with us, right? So what would make you not a candidate to match with us? Well, I guess the first thing would be is if you couldn't get a license. So if we don't have passing scores at the USMLE, uh, we're, we would be a little bit worried. Like if, there, if, if someone doesn't have a passing step two score, for instance, it would, it would not be a good idea to interview them because we're not sure that they'll pass and they wouldn't be able to get a license, right? So that, that, that's a, so you have to have, you know, three pa or two passing scores you have to be able to get a state a state license the other thing you know obvious red flags would be like 
and, and this doesn't apply very often, but you know, like criminal criminal offenses, felonies like that, you know. Um, but uh, outside of that, um, I think the big thing that we look for is no gap of more than five years between graduation from medical school. But even with that, we've we've offered interviews for that. If, if people have been in practice in another country or if they did a fellowship or something like that, uh, we'll look at that. Um, so the, that's not an absolute, but that that's one of the things. And then obviously, um, if your application is incomplete, um, those those are those are ways. And so you want to make sure you release your scores. You want to make sure all your letters are there. We do, you know, we I think we have, I have to actually I should know this. I think we have a three-letter requirement. Um Three and we we don't necessarily always look at the like the quote unquote chair letter the same as we do um like a personal letter. So I, I I think having personal letters of recommendation are probably favored and having you know three of those. Um red flags, I think. Um anything that I mean now now I think anything that looks like it could have been written by AI will be a red flag. Um if there's a if there's a discrepancy in you know what you write in your personal statement and like what's on your CV, I mean that that obviously will get things. Um, uh, and then if there's incomplete, you know, if there's a time gap that isn't explained, I mean th those those are about th those are some of the red flags. And then we also have these things sort of like pink flags, you know, beware. You know, there's there's sometimes on the dean's letters or letters of recommendation if they're not good letter writers, um, you know, they'll have this like vague you know, statements about that don't really say anything and maybe kind of skirt around the issue about someone's performance, you know, like they showed up every day or they generally were open to feedback. I mean, that, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. So th that sort of falls into the pink flag, but students don't have any control over that. Um, the things that they have control over is who they ask to write their letters. And I always recommend that they ask someone to write them a strong letter and say, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? And if somebody offers to write a letter, um, that's usually a good sign. Um, but the personal statement should really just be a reflection of their own um, values. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a recapitulation of their CV. That's not a red flag, but, you know, we want to hear about you. I mean, we we want to hear the kinds of like, what was your road to medicine? Not just a hardship road, but like, what kind of things do you have to overcome? What What biases have you faced or how have you grown as a person, you know, that that's becoming increasingly hard to tell people apart. And sometimes there's that little inkling of perseverance or resilience or some sort of grit that can be in a personal statement that that really can set someone apart. Um, and, and I, and I know that there's maybe a little bit of difficulty in explaining that because culturally some people don't want to talk about the things they've had to go through, um, at, at, you know, wh wherever they're from or some of the things overcome. And so we're not making a spectacle of those things, but I definitely would encourage people to tell their story uh, as they understand it, because that's that's who we really want to know. And that's that's the part I find as a program director right now, just to be, it, I mean, it's amazing the experiences some of the um, residents in our program have had. And I I just can't believe I get a chance to work with them. It's, it's like a, I'm, yeah, I have a lot of gratitude for that. So those are the kinds of things we, we, we want to hear about. Exactly. And I, I have sometimes applicants have amazing stories of, you know, challenges, hardships that they overcame until they came here. And they don't highlight that. They talk about patient presentation for like two paragraphs, 55 year old diabetes, like, no, we want to talk about you and that patient. And I want to talk about your experiences. What got you in the specialty? Why you want to come here? So it's, it's an art and I made multiple videos to help people with that. So if you want to learn about personal statement, go ahead and check these videos out. For, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great point. So one of the one of the first year residents who I just worked with, he was like an Olympic caliber sprinter. I, I don't know if it was in his application. It just came out in conversation one day, and I was like, "How did we get you in our program?" I mean, it was like you know, it's just it's just cool the things you learn, and I, I just encourage people to be themselves. Awesome, awesome. Now moving to our fifth question, which is the step scores. All IMGs ask me about step scores every day. In their opinion, the step scores are the defining factor of you getting an interview or not. If you have that score, you're in. If you don't have that score, you're out. What is your take on that? Um, that in our system, that is not um, that is not the reality. I, and I'm not contradicting anyone's opinion because obviously we look at 
Well, we're not looking at step one scores at all. So, I mean, unless someone fails, has failed a step exam, it will not affect you positively or negatively in our in our process, regardless of country of origin. And then uh, we do look at the step two score because it's there to look at. And we don't once once um, once you pass, uh, we don't, you know, take away points on our rubric, but we sometimes add a point or two if somebody had a like in the 95th percentile or something like that. So on the on the grand scheme of things, that's like two to three percent of the overall potential score. So it really doesn't make or break. Um, I mean, you would get just as many points or more, um, you know, with with having really strong letters of recommendation, for instance, and combine that with a good personal statement that has some sort of statement about, you know, your life or what you've overcome or some co compelling, you know, journey that you've been on in medicine. So we don't take it away completely, but it, it's been much, much overrated and overused in the past. Although we still want people to get credit for, you know, doing really well on it, but we just don't overemphasize that. So that, I would not say that that's a major criterion for selection for an interview. And it has almost nothing to do with ranking if you interview with us. That's very glad to hear. I, you know, always encourage people to study well, perform well on the exams. And I think, as you said, they should get credit for that, but it should not be the factor. You should not be, you know, being interviewed or ranked just based on score. So it's glad to hear that. This yes. Is so just, just to let you know, we we really try to have a non-biased uh, uh, interview process. So all of our interviewers go through anti-bias training. And um, we actually blind the interviewers to the grades and the uh, board scores. So the, the person that's on the other side of the Zoom when you're interviewing with us, doesn't know your board scores or your grades. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> so that's definitely gives an unbiased opinion because no matter what, if you know the score, you might have bias to ask certain type of questions that would favor, you know, higher score. Yeah, that's that's what the research would show too. Um, we also, we also blind, um, you know, to like, if you got into AOA or some of these other words, we, I mean, you can say that to your interviewer, but it's not like you're getting this big, you know, plate of all these awards and things like that. So if it's in your personal statement or if it's in there, I mean, people will still find out, but we just, we just really want people to get to know them as an applicant without this pre-existing uh, sort of bias. Awesome. Six questions about research. We talked about, you know, one of the pillars being academic potential and research. What what do you look for when you're assessing research? Is it publication, experience? Yeah, so that, that's a that's a really good and uh, I think a really relevant question in this day and age because we are looking to mark ourselves apart from others uh, because there's no step one score and but it, it is a it is something that we look for evidence and potential for scholarship. Um, I mean our our pro our program um, does prize a patient first approach. I mean the Cleveland Clinic does. However, we are also well known for, you know, translational research, clinical research, and, and innovation. Um, our residency program, for what it's worth, is ranked number nine in the country in research output for residents in our medicine program. So our residents are very productive. Um, and we have a good system in place for those that want to do research in subspecialties and or general medicine, for instance, and we have a clinical school. We, we, we have a lot of things that promote research. Um, but you don't have to come in, you know, with a lab or, you know, grants or, you know, even publications. You know, there's plenty of people that match in our program that are relatively research naive, um, having never done bench or clinical research. But it's really about the potential and their interest in it that we gauge. But I will say that, you know, again, everything in its due course, everything has a season. If someone comes in and has an advanced degree, for instance, we take that into consideration positively. If they've had a first author publication, we take that into consideration positively. But again, it's also measured against the other things that I talked about. So, you know, coming in with a is an MD, PhD, for instance, with three first author publications, that'll get you a certain amount of points, but it won't keep climbing. And we don't want to double count that against some of the other clinical things. So it's emphasized and it's prized, but we definitely have people that haven't had a lot of research experience that also come to our program. Awesome. We touched base briefly about the U.S. clinical experience. I want to ask a question about the types of U.S. clinical experience. As you know, most IMGs come to the U.S. after they graduate. They're not eligible for the electives or sub that 
fourth year senior students do. Uh, what do you think the value of these externship or observerships that people do to get experience in the U.S. and U.S. LORs? Uh, you know, I, I think it's highly variable on the medical center where you're doing the observership. And I think it has a lot to do with who's sponsoring you, too. I, I've participated um, on the, you know, like the faculty end of observerships. And I mean, I think you can actually tell a lot about a person. I mean, I have we have this issue. I mean, we have there are former um, international medical grads who are working in research at Cleveland Clinic. Some of them have shadowed, observed with me, and I I feel like they're a member of the team. I mean, they can um, they can have clinical reasoning discussions with you. They can certainly have com interpersonal communication. I'm thinking about the competencies. They can demonstrate competency based. Um, achievement in a lot of ways just by being a member of the team. So um, I think they're of value, but I think it is it is uh, specific to where you're doing it, who you're doing it with. And that isn't meant to sound, you know, like it's some sort of fraternity. You have to work with these people to be good. But I, I mean, I, I don't look at it skeptically. I just want to know more. I want to know more about what you were actually doing, how long you were doing it. And I think longitudinal is better. Um, you know, a week somewhere is probably not as good as a month. And if you do something with someone, you know, one week uh, uh, a month or one week every week for uh, a year, for instance, that means a lot more because then a person can get a really long view of you. So there's a there's a student or not a student, a former, you know, she's a doctor who's worked with me several times longitudinally. And I, I told her, you know, I hope she's applying to a residency because I think she's going to be great. And I, I could... I could see her working with our residents because I've seen her working alongside of our residents as an observer. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. I can see, you know, I agree with you regarding where you're doing it. You have to do it with people that we kind of trust, recognize and work long enough with someone so they can say something about you or they're not just like these generic this person is hardworking and as you said, shows up right. to work. And, you know, they have to have these personal connections with you and evaluate you on a long multiple day basis so they can say something legit about you and genuine about you. And I and I do worry about, I don't know if this exists or not. I've always wondered about predatory, almost like predatory uh observerships where it costs a lot of money and you're not sure. You know, I, I know that there's an exchange probably insinuated, you'll get a letter if you do this, but I just I would instruct students to be careful and and go go to places where students have had success in the past or you know former students have had success in the past. But you're I think you hit it right on the head when you said you know it's it's probably better to be a clinical rotator at a place as long as you can you know also you know you can rotate as a as a visiting student obviously and be an AI um, even in our in our setting and have real patient care. But th those are harder to obtain when you're still in school. But even that can be of limited value if it doesn't have the longitudinal nature or, or if you're actually performing as a acting intern, for instance, um, like like the other students on site. So um, I, I think that there's pluses and minus to observerships. I, I tend to see glass half full more so than not based on my personal experience with 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 those that I've done it with. But um, with that caveat. And thank you for pointing out regarding like some, you know, rotations offering LORs for money. And I feel that sometimes even the students are looking for this type of stuff. So they don't want to put the effort to get the LOR. A lot of students have the expectation, oh, I'm like just showing up. I'm just going to follow that physician for like a month and get an LOR. And that's not the case. You have to study, prepare for the patient. That's how you can impress someone. I love the, the idea that you mentioned that sometimes even without, uh, you know, doing an actual sub I just observership, you can tell about the student. My my friend matched at Baylor, which is like a you know, good program, a very good program. By doing an observership there, he was able to impress the people by his knowledge, his demeanor, the way he shows up, not just like following people around. So I feel it's both on the students and some companies that just offer people, you know, rotations to to come and get an LOR. And I think you need to earn it. The LOR, you need to work for it. You don't just get it. Awesome. So we touched base about the gap idea and year of graduation. Uh, my eighth question is regarding the gap, how do you define the gap? If somebody, for example, trained in India, they did residency in India, worked for two, three years, and now applying to residency, is that considered a gap? Or by gap, you mean 
uh, somebody who is not doing anything. Yeah, so I think we're more concerned about a gap where there's no patient care or, um, you know, research is fine, but we, we, we would prefer to know about clinical activity within the last five years if it's like, what is that? And there, there's actually, um, and they're in our, there's members of our program that trained in India and they did um, internship or we even had somebody that did foundations training in the UK, um, you know, and, and uh, that, you know, even though they graduated from medical school, they were still in a training program. So, and, and we don't, we don't um, categorically say no way. In fact, we'll look at, we, we look at people all the time that that are beyond the gap that otherwise have a pretty exemplary career. And it's just about what were they doing in between. Awesome. My ninth question is, how does the selection process work at the Cleveland Clinic? We've talked about so many factors, but do you, uh, you know, evaluate all applicants? Do you divide? The, how does this process work? Like as an so this is this is a really good question, and I'm happy to share with you. Um, it's a very long hour intensive hours intensive process. We get about six thousand to sixty five hundred applications. Wow. Um, we try to sort those the best we can electronically into those that we think. Are, are real candidates, uh, and everybody's a real candidate, but like good candidates with no failures, you know, don't have a five-year gap, or we understand sort of what their status is. And then we look at a large proportion of those manually. Um, we divide up into teams. I'm very involved. Our chief residents are very involved. Our faculty leaders, our associate program directors, we have nine and we also have 17 core faculty and we have others that volunteer to help. So with that, that that mob of 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 people descends upon this extremely large bolus of applications and we we score every one that we can. Um, and then, you know, sometimes uh, if if we if we don't, we sometimes get you know a little gift from above and somebody will say, hey, we look at my application. And whether it's a student or a faculty member or somebody that worked with somebody. And so uh, we, we, we do uh, rely a little bit on people to remind us about people that are in there that we maybe didn't find, um, whether they rotated with us or if it's somebody that, um, you know, is local or something like that. So with that system, we feel much better uh, suited to not miss anybody who's really good. Um, and that's really what we're looking for. We're trying to be as equitable air um, and, um, uh, inclusive as we can. So it takes a lot of time. I wish there was a way to put it into AI and just say, these are the 600 people you should interview, but we interview about 600 to 650 people. Um, and, and so it's a pretty big cut to go from 6,000 to 600, but that's, that's all we have capacity for because, um, that's a lot of faculty time to do those interviews. Our actual selection process then on the interview day is you get, everybody gets two interviews. Um, we have some um, behaviorally based questions and some standard, you know, interview questions, but it's really a time to explore the space with the, with the interviewer and the applicant. Um, and then we also have some downtime during our day too, where you're just, you know, you know, go get a drink of water, go to the bathroom. And we have a meet and greet uh, with the chiefs uh, and there's, you know, other interactions the night before, sort of a happy hour kind of thing. Um, and it's good. And we, we have open lines of communication after the interview. If you have questions, you can reach out to us. We don't do any hijinks. I mean, we abide by the, um, code of conduct. We don't send confusing post interview communications. We don't, you know, we don't block people's emails from sending us thank you notes, but we don't respond to them. Usually, uh, we follow the rules. Um, but we're also, you know, I trained in the South. I'm very Southern and hospitality wise. And so um, if you have a question for me, I'm happy to answer it. And if if we can put you in contact with someone on the residency, uh, we'll do that. Because um, we found that that's, that's the way to treat people is, is through, you know, being polite and hospitable. So let's say you interviewed with us and, and you had a question about cardiology or cardiology research, I could put you in contact with one of the residents, for instance, um, and, and, or one of the faculty and that, that dialogue would go on in the background and I would have no idea what's going on. It doesn't affect your rank. It doesn't affect your, your matchability. Um, it's really for you to make a selection. So, you know, I, I look at this as a job interview, um, and it's a job interview for us and for you. So you're interviewing us too. And I say this to all applicants is like, we want you to want to come here. And so we're going to give you all the information that you feel like you need to move across the country or across the world. 
uh, to to train to train with us for three years. That is really impressive. So if I understood correctly, almost all application gets read by some you know part of the team and evaluated and a decision is made to interview or not. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say almost <laughs> as many as we can, um, up, upwards of several thousand. So <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. That's and a we, re we read it all. I mean, we read the Dean's letter, the, you know, the, the letters of recommendation, the personal statement. Awesome, awesome. So this is another question we touched base on, but we can like summarize it very quickly. What mistakes do you find applicants do usually in their application or things are advised to avoid doing these mistakes? I, I think um, putting stuff in your application that, that maybe you don't know as much about as you think uh, to try to make it look good, um, that that almost always never works because invariably somebody will ask you a question about your research or your your ho hobbies and interests are being taken out now, I know. But that was, that was always one of the things that I would go for is the hobbies and interests. And if you like, for instance, if you say that you enjoy mountaineering and you've climbed all the 8,000 meter peaks in the United States or in the world, I'll say, tell me more about that. And, and if you don't know anything about, you know, mountaineering, then that's a problem, right? So not, not you know, overstating things on your CV is a definite, you don't want to do that. And then um, I think over-reliance on some of the things that uh, that we talked about that we put weight in, but but not so much weight that it defines a person. So research is a classic one. People will start talking about research as the is their go to thing, and we want to hear more about, like I said, you and and your patient care journey because ultimately we're training general internists who may do research or general internists that go into subspecialty. And I think so overemphasizing the subspecialty goals you have or overemphasizing the research goals, at least in our program, it's not it's not a mistake. It's just that that's not as useful as some of the other uh, approaches people can have. And I, I think um, any applicant who's just generally curious uh, will be uh, viewed well. If that comes through in their application, then that's great. Awesome. So for one of those with the highest score, I assume they get the interview. How many people interview each applicant? Is it the majority of the you know faculty? Is it a certain number? Oh, that's a good question. So because we have to have about 13 to 1400 individual interview sessions, we rely heavily on our core faculty and APDs. Um, I interview about 90 to 100 people personally. Um, and our core faculty may interview like 30 to 40 each. And then our APDs may do the same number, or maybe a few more. And then we also rely on a, other leaders. I mean, our, our chairs will interview. Uh, department chairs. Um, we've had uh, institute chairs interview. Um, uh, we've had uh, general practitioner, you know, like uh, primary care physicians in our um, preceptorship group that precept the residents. We even have people come that don't work with residents that just want to get to know the residency and engage. We have subspecialists, hospitalists, you name it. Um, as long as they're an internist, <laughs> they have to be an internist. Um, but I think last year for the 1400 unique interviews we did or unique interview experiences, I think about half came from Department of Hospital Medicine, probably a quarter came from, you know, general medicine, and then uh, about a quarter came from all the rest of the subspecialties combined, which is pretty good. It's pretty good diversity. Oh, so some, some GI physicians or some kind yeah. of... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, cardiology are all the specialties are really represented. And if you look at our leadership map, like, I'm sorry, our leadership composite, if you look at our leadership composite, I've worked really hard to have a diverse leadership group too. Um, we have a great mix of generalists, hospitalists, subspecialists, uh, those that are IMGs actually, um, and also DOs. I mean, we have, a, I think we, we have it covered as far as like who's applying to our residency, who's in our residency and who leads our residency. Perfect. You emphasize the value of interviews. What qualities do you look for uh, when interviewing applicants? Uh, authenticity is the thing that I look for. Um, and, um, you know, that that comes through the themes and some of the things that are written match what how you're acting or how a person portrays themselves, which is hard. But I just think just be truthful and being authentic. I try to um, I, I personally look for a, you know, a positive interaction. And so, you know, having questions about the program, um, I think are always a good thing. 
Um, and, and I think just being flexible um, too. I mean, we do ask some behaviorally rooted questions and uh, you're not, there's no right or wrong answer a lot of ways and you, you don't have to be right. Um, and I think just being honest. So I, I like authenticity um, because ultimately, I mean, it's very highly likely that if, if you interview with us and you match with us, you're going to be working with us too. And that, <laughs> that's where, that's the time to be authentic. So it would help if those matched up. But you always tell me, we look for someone we can talk to in the operating room. We'll be spending hours with you more than your family. So we rather have fun with you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we do have a very lighthearted approach, but it's not like, um, it's not like a party atmosphere or anything, but we do have a very upbeat, lighthearted approach um, in our interview day, for instance. It's very fun. Awesome. When it comes to racking, we also touched base quickly on that. How much is the interview versus the application? I would say it's probably uh, two thirds interview, one third application. And is it scored? Is the interview have like a score and you, is it like- a Yeah, yeah we do actually. Uh, we're, we're very detail oriented when it comes to the scoring. Um, you know, we, we have uh, behaviorally, or we have anchored um, scoring system. So the, uh, you know, interviewer one and interviewer two will use the same anchors around the ratings. Um, I mean, we even have a system in place that looks for um, outliers or, or if there's a discrepancy. We, we look forward before um, the rank meeting actually to rec to adjudicate those discrepancies so that we understand what's really happening. You know, it's possible that you can have two different views of the same person and that are completely valid, right? And, and so you have divergent scores based on uh, something that happened in one interview versus not. And that, that's all valid information. But we also are sensitive to the fact that some people have different standards. And so we we really try to keep it as fair and equitable as possible. Um, and that's why we use the um, sort of anchored scoring system. It's anchored to actual behaviors and things like that. Awesome. I'm bringing it to my final question, which is what do you think are the strengths of the Cleveland Clinic Internal Medicine Program and why applicants listening to this video should consider this as their number one rank? Oh, that's a that's a great that's a great lead in. I, I think the people there's so many things that I think make our residency notable. Um, when I was interviewing for this job, I was pretty sold that it was probably a good job. I, I came in person after having a screening interview and I started meeting the faculty and I started meeting those on the search committee. Um, and I, it was great. I mean, you know, there's like this thing on the wall that says, you know, patients first. It, it's a beautiful facility too, but really it's the people. Uh, it was my meeting with the residents who were on the selection committee that I was like, this is the place for me. I mean, 10 minutes in there, I felt like this was the place. And that was a great you know, microcosm of what our residency is. And so I would say our biggest strength is our community, um, is the kindness of the community, the inclusiveness of the community of our residents. And that's the residency program for sure, but that's also GME. You know, the graduate medical education enterprise really defines a lot of what happens in a program. And our DIO, uh, Dr. Jeremy Lippman and our Education Institute Chair, Jamie Stoller, and all the other program directors have a, just an incredible culture and community here at Cleveland Clinic. And our residency program is a proud member of that. We're the biggest program in the place, but it allows our residents to have the autonomy to have a community and to, um, you know, have the uh, um, emotional intelligence to, to be good citizens with each other too. We have a very positive, um, I would say, uh, sustainable workflow. The, the work hours that we do, we don't have 24 hour call. I mean, there's so many things, but I think it's. I think it starts with the residents uh, in the in that community, and also it doesn't hurt. I mean, it would. I would be negligent in not talking about the clinical environment. It's one of the best hospitals in the world. All of our departments in medicine are ranked in the many, if not all, are ranked in the top ten in the United States. Cardiology is number one, probably in the world. I mean, it's a good place to practice too, and that's usually makes for a good clinical learning environment. So, but if I, I, I guess if I was really forced to say, I would say it's the residents that make it the best program in the country. That's just my opinion. That's what is it. Thank you so much, Dr. Wardrop, for this amazing, insightful discussion about the 
the residency process, the selection, and the program. Do you have any final thoughts for people listening to this video, applying for Match 2024? And yeah, I, I just want to say um, thank you for having me, but also to everyone that's out there. Um, I just that's considering going into medicine or considering, you know, big big M medicine, like all of medicine, surgery, pediatrics, everything. Um, and also internal medicine. I just want to say thank you for um, for joining the world's greatest profession. I, I truly believe that. And for all that's written about burnout and, you know, the medical system and everything, it's still the greatest uh, profession to me. My daughter just started medical school. And so uh, we get a chance to keep the family business alive. But I just want to say thank you for your interest. And, and don't be dismayed by this process. Um, you will make it through the match. Uh, hopefully, you'll end up where you want to be. Uh, but if you're not, um, you know, there, it, that is not the end of the world. And there's there's always help around the corner within the community where you find yourself. So I just want to offer encouragement, but also gratitude. Thanks for having me. So that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you so much, Dr. Wardrobe, for your time and this extremely insightful interview. For our viewers, if you are a match applicant and you need help with your personal statements, CV editing, or interview preparation, make sure to check out the Match Guy services that will help you every step of the process so you can ace your residency match. Also, if you're applying this cycle, don't miss the detailed tutorial I did on how to fill your ES application and you can check that out by clicking on the link here and I'll leave the link for all our resources related to the match in the description below. Good luck on your match.